Thank you, President Tripathi. It's now my pleasure to introduce our honored speaker for this commencement, Susan Denser. Susan is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading peer-reviewed journal focused on the intersection of health, health care, and health policy in the United States and the world. One of the, one of the nation's most respected health and health policy journalists, she is an on-air analyst on health issues with the PBS NewsHour and a frequent guest and commentator on such national public radio shows as The American Life. Susan is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine and the Council on Foreign Relations. At Health Affairs, Susan oversees the journal's team of nearly 30 editors and staff in producing the monthly publication and website. Health Affairs has been described by the Washington Post as the, quote, Bible, end of quote, of health policy. Its articles and their authors are frequently cited in the congressional record and in congressional testimony, as well as in the news media. The Health Affairs website recorded 21 and a half million page views in 2009. Before joining Health Affairs in 2009, Susan was an on-air health correspondent at the PBS NewsHour. From 1998 to 2008, she led the show's unit, providing in-depth coverage of health care, health policy, and social security. Prior to joining the PBS NewsHour, she was chief economics correspondent and economics columnist for the U.S. News and World Report, and previously was a senior writer covering business and economic news at Newsweek. Susan's other work in television has included appearances as a regular analyst and commentator on CNN and the McLaughlin Group. Her writing has earned her several fellowships, including a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University, where she studied health economics and policy, and a U.S.-Japan Leadership Program Fellowship, during which she reached and researched the effects of the rapidly aging Japanese population. Susan is an elected member of the National Academy of Social Insurance, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization made up of the nation's leading experts on social insurance, is a fellow of the Hastings Center, a nonpartisan research institution dedicated to bioethics and the public interest. She is a member of the Board of Overseers of the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian organization providing relief to refugees and displaced persons around the world. She chairs the International Rescue Committee's program committee, which oversees the organization's activities in resettling refugees in the United States and dealing with refugees and displaced persons in roughly 25 countries. A graduate of Dartmouth and holder of an honorary Master of Arts from the institution, Susan is a Dartmouth trustee emerita and chaired the Dartmouth Board of Trustees from 2001 to 2004. She currently serves on the Board of Overseers of Dartmouth Medical School. Susan has entitled her address, Congratulations, now please go reinvent U.S. healthcare. <laughs> it's a personal pleasure to introduce and welcome Susan Denser. Thank you so much, Dean Kane. President Tripathi, Dean Kane, distinguished guests, members of the faculty, Parents, thank you for the honor of being your speaker today, and congratulations to you, the class of 2011. Can you believe it? You made it. All those long days and nights back in college, taking organic chemistry and all the other courses you had to take to get into medical school, 
sweating out the MCATs, making it through the medical school admissions process, and did I mention those loan applications that some of you had to fill out along the way? Then came medical school itself. Now wasn't that a picnic? Gross anatomy, integrated study of the gastrointestinal system and metabolism, your clinical clerkships, those experiences with real patients, and then the joys, and I understand this year they really were the joys for so many of you, the joys of match day. Well, I know you squeezed in some fun along the way. I heard that there was a bunch of you who cheered Dr. Lessie up by dressing in his very much preferred type of attire, like preppies. And I heard that others of you paid homage to another of your professors by founding a rock group named after the way he stood. <laughs> Hot stance. I'll let you explain that joke later to your parents and relatives and everybody else here who doesn't know what the heck I'm talking about. I know all of this, uh, and furthermore, I know more because I've been told that you weren't all just always focused on grade grubbing. Megana Gadil spent a year in Bangladesh as a Fulbright scholar. Congratulations. Others of you went down to Ecuador to volunteer with the Dean Star program there. And still others of you volunteered to spend time right here in Buffalo to provide care for the underserved community at the Lighthouse Clinic. You made it through some of the most intensive academic experiences of your lives, and you still made a point to do good at places both near and far. Bravo, bravo. So sit back for a moment, relax, and just luxuriate in the satisfaction of having accomplished and achieved so much these last few years. Let's see, I'm gonna give you exactly three more seconds to do that. Why am I being so generous with my time? Because frankly, there's no time to waste. I congratulate you again most sincerely for all you've done, but now, you've got to go out and reinvent US healthcare. Now some of you are probably saying, lady, please, can we just take the weekend off? Well, let's think about that for a moment. You all know that the US spends more money per person than any country in the world on healthcare, a total of $2.7 trillion, it's estimated, this year alone. That's just under $9,000 per person. And that means just over the course of this weekend, we'll spend about $18 billion as a country on healthcare on average. Now to put that in perspective, that's bigger than the entire economy of the nation of Botswana, which happens to be in the African context, a relatively rich country. Now we all know a whole lot of good is going to be done with those dollars that will be spent on healthcare this weekend. Somebody who's got a heart attack will be rushed to the hospital and saved. Somebody else is gonna go into cardiac arrest and will be virtually brought back from the dead. Lots of new babies are going to be born. And Americans really across the country are going to get some of the best and most sophisticated and most caring and compassionate healthcare available any place in the world. But we also know, because the Institute of Medicine tells us this, that for about half of the care that will be delivered this weekend, there will be no direct evidence that it actually works. So that means this weekend, undoubtedly, somebody is going to get a procedure that probably won't work that he or she probably doesn't really need and will end up paying the consequences for that, not just in terms of a higher health care bill, but maybe even in side effects or worse. We also know that US health care for all of its glories isn't as coordinated as it could be or should be. 
David Lawrence used to run a big uh, West Coast-based system that many of you will know, Kaiser Permanente, and he wrote a piece about uh, for us in Health Affairs a few years ago about the time when his own elderly mother fell down at her assisted living center and broke her leg. From the time she was taken in the, in the ambulance to the hospital, through the surgeries that she underwent, the hospital stays, then into a nursing home and finally into rehab, to the time she got back home, more than 80 different people took care of her. Three primary care docs, an emergency room doctor, two radiologists, an orthopedic surgeon, an anesthesiologist, a geriatrician, and a wound care specialist. She had at least 50 different nurses, 10 physical and occupational therapists, and a host of nurses' aides. And then four more nurses and two social workers arranged for her transfers back home. I'll shock you by telling you that there were more than 80 people here involved, and not all of them were always on the same page. Many problems cropped up along the way as she was handed off from one care provider to another. So uh, David Lawrence wrote in this essay for us, at times, mom's care seemed like a pickup soccer game in which the participants were all playing together for the first time, didn't know each other's names, and wore earmuffs so they couldn't hear each other. My mother ricocheted from place to place like a pinball. Each contact brought another bill, different advice, and increased risk that something could go wrong. Well, that's how it works in the US healthcare non-system that you're about to take a part in. So it's really no surprise that this weekend alone, several thousand people on Medicare who were in the hospital a month ago are gonna go back into the hospital because of their chronic illnesses. Why? Because something wasn't coordinated. Somebody wrote incomplete discharge instructions that the family couldn't read, or the patient couldn't understand and didn't know how to take the medication, or the follow-up appointment with the family doctor was three weeks away. So what do you know? Suddenly mom's congestive heart failure or whatever she has is worse, and she's back in the hospital again. Well, we also know that when mom gets back in that hospital, the health care she gets isn't as safe or reliable as it should be for patients. So this very weekend, somewhere in America, a bunch of people, we don't know how many, will be victims of medication errors. A few others will develop pressure ulcers that were preventable, but weren't prevented because nobody bothered to turn them in the bed. Some people are gonna get MRSA infections. One in three people admitted to the hospital this weekend will be victims of an adverse event. And on average, according to data published by the Joint Commission, about a dozen people over the next few days will have the wrong site of their bodies operated on. And that's if they're lucky, because for some people, it won't just be the wrong side of their bodies, it'll be the wrong person. Now, none of this is gonna happen because of bad people in healthcare, far from it. We know that Far and away, most of the people in healthcare are really good people. They're people like you. Once upon a time, they were sitting here just like you, looking forward to that brilliant future that President Tripathi described. They just ended up in systems where being a good person isn't quite good enough. They also ended up practicing healthcare in a country that sometimes seems to take even healthcare more seriously than it takes health. Just think about it for a minute. On average, this weekend, more than 2,000 teenagers and even tweens are gonna smoke their first cigarette. Hopefully for a lot of them it will be the last, but we know otherwise. For many of them it will be just the first of many. Tens of thousands of McDonald's Big Mac meals with Cokes and fries are gonna be sold this weekend, clocking in at about 1,200 calories apiece, more than half the daily requirements for an average woman or man. The NPR station I listened to in Washington had a story on the other day about a five-year-old boy visiting his pediatrician. He weighed in at 100 pounds. So put it this way, literally millions of Americans 
are going to be doing their dead level best this weekend to guarantee that someday they will be your patients. Is it their responsibility to be healthier and to behave in better ways? Absolutely. Is it all their fault that they're not healthier? Well, I ask you, you know some of these neighborhoods around Buffalo or around the rest of our country. Would you go out for a long exercise walk at night after you got home from work? Do you see entrepreneurs lining up to build fancy produce stands selling fruits and vegetables and grabbing some of that business that would otherwise go to McDonald's in the heart of our nation's cities? Or how many heart surgeons have you seen picketing the streets lately, demanding changes in society so they won't uh, have as many patients as they have now? You get why I don't even want to give you the weekend off before you get busy reinventing healthcare. Now, you're lucky because despite what you've heard from a lot of old timers in medicine or from even talk radio shows, this is a really exciting time in healthcare. Regardless of your political persuasion, you have to acknowledge that there's really been a sea change in attitudes in this country, partly with the enactment of health reform. We know the country is on an unsustainable path when it comes to how we run healthcare and the healthcare system. Most enlightened people know that. Uh, there was a great old economist, Herb Stein, who used to say, things that cannot go on forever will stop. How true. Your generation is going to have to figure out how to improve the quality of healthcare and make it cost a lot less. But how? Well, we know because we publish studies on it in my journal, Health Affairs, that if health spending grows at its current pace year by year for the next 75 years, that over that period, 119% of the entire increase in per capita gross domestic product will go into health care. Let me put that another way. In 75 years, more than the entire additional economic resources we generate as a country, and then some, will go into health care. That means we could be standing here 75 years from now with nothing else going on in this country but people getting health care and people giving health care. Is that sustainable? Something that cannot go on forever like that is going to stop. We know that if current obesity trends continue, in 30 years, more than 80% of the adult US population is going to be overweight or obese. Or to paraphrase the comedian Stephen Colbert, at that point, 80% of the US population will be 160% of the US population in terms of total mass. It's not sustainable. It's going to stop. We also know there are about 50 million people without health insurance now, and that even with the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act, about 32 million at best will get health coverage. Now that's great, uh, and it makes it a whole lot less likely that someday you'll be standing in front of a patient performing a so-called wallet biopsy, trying to figure out if the patient has insurance that will cover the care that you're about to recommend. But we do the math and we know that even with 32 million more people covered, that will still leave us with at least 20 million or so without health insurance. That's not so great. And think about this, if the Affordable Care Act is to be repealed and not replaced with anything meaningful, that means not only 50 million un uninsured today, but over time, no doubt, millions and millions more. What would come of that? How sustainable would that be? Maybe there'd be so much political unrest and pressure that we'd end up with a real government takeover of health care, rather than the public-private efforts that are at the heart of the Affordable Care Act. You see, what I'm trying to get at is that neither you as soon-to-be practicing physicians nor any of the rest of us can afford to walk away from the imperative of reinventing health and healthcare in America. We've got to do better. 
The late comedian George Carlin was a real pessimist about Americans. He said he didn't think there was any problem in this country, no matter how severe, that Americans, when they rolled up their sleeves, couldn't completely ignore. Then there was Winston Churchill, the late British prime minister. He was more optimistic. He said, Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other alternatives. <laughs> we look around us and we see all kinds of ways in which we as Americans have behaved as Churchill described. We have finally rolled up our sleeves and gotten things right. There might still be 40 wrong site surgeries every week in the US, but if we look over at another industry, aviation, we know there aren't 40 plane crashes a week because the field of aviation decided to get serious about safety. So can healthcare. There may be 50 million Americans without health insurance, but there aren't 50 million American drivers without car insurance. Why? Because we built a system that made it impossible for that to happen. There may be thousands of kids starting to smoke this weekend, but there won't be hundreds killed in auto accidents for not wearing seatbelts because we decided as a country that we weren't gonna let that happen anymore either. So we know that we have it as citizens of this country to look around and say, enough is enough. Maybe not right away, as Churchill suggested, but we do eventually, usually, get around with it, uh, to it. And as recent graduates, you are gonna have uh, amazing tools with which to reinvent healthcare. Things that the class who was sitting right in your place 15 years ago couldn't even have dreamed of. You're gonna have electronic health records to keep better tabs on your patients and coordinate their care from one site to another. If you become cancer specialists or other sophisticated specialties, you'll be able to draw on truly a treasure trove of new information about specific roles of specific genes, genetic types of tumors that you'll be able to understand and prescribe far more effective treatments for your patients. You'll live in a world that is so much more interconnected digitally and otherwise than ever we could have imagined. And that means that if you pioneer an important breakthrough in patient care or in health systems, or frankly any other aspect of health or health care, you'll have unprecedented opportunity, not just to benefit your patients or those of us who are lucky enough to be here in the United States, but truly people all over the world. So that brings us back to you and why it's so timely that we're all here today celebrating your graduation, thanking your families who got you here today and the faculty here at Buffalo and the administrators who taught you and saw you through. See, you may think that your being here today is all about you, but the rest of us look at you and we think differently. We think this is all about us. You're about to go off and become house officers at some pretty great places, some of the leading lights of American healthcare, and you really, really have a chance to make a difference for us. So whether you end up at something called an accountable care organization or in a five person or even a three person or even a solo practice, you will have the opportunity not just to be a great doctor to your patients, you will have an opportunity, really the opportunity of a lifetime to reinvent healthcare. You clearly picked the right time to go to medical school. It looks like you even picked the right time to be born. So congratulations, go out there, reinvent US healthcare. Good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>